Hello, everyone, and welcome. It's been a little while. My name is Beth Foss, and I am the Director of Operations at the Croideremia Research Foundation. I'm super excited that you're joining us today on a very warm summer day here, at least in Southern Lancaster County. Um, but today we're going to be learning more about gene therapy, AAV gene therapy, from a new face to our organization, but we're really excited. Her name is Lilia Koza, Dr. Lilia Koza, and she is with Opus genetics and she's going to be sharing a presentation and taking lots of questions from our audience today about AAV gene therapy and about her company specifically if you like. So as always we're going to use the chat feature and the um, Q&A. Go ahead and type in your questions and as they come in and she takes a break between slides, I'll be sure to um, pose your questions to her and certainly we'll do that again at the end. Um, we always want to thank our sponsor, 4DMT, for partnering with us to help present these really valuable um, webinars. And we're just super excited to have you, our audience, and Dr. Lilia. Thanks for coming today. Yeah, thank you for having me. We're super excited. Me too. I'll, <laughs> I'll go ahead and shut down here. Okay, I'll go ahead and share my uh, slides here. Give me one second. And I'll get a pointer up. All right, so hopefully uh, everyone can see my slides. That, that looks, looks good. good. That okay. looks good, thank you. Thanks, and yeah, just let me know during the presentation if anything um, doesn't look right or yeah, just let me know. You bet. Um, so yeah, thank you all for listening in on your lunch hour. Um, my name is Lily Acosa, and I'm an associate scientist at Opus Genetics and we're a AAV gene therapy company um, that develops AAV gene therapies for inherited retinal diseases, and we're located in Durham, North Carolina. So I'm very excited to talk to you today about the behind the scenes of gene therapy. Um, and I'd also like to thank Coroideremia Research Foundation for the opportunity to, to give this talk. Uh, so before we begin, I'll tell you a little bit about myself. I joined Opus Genetics about a year ago, and prior to that, I was finishing up my PhD uh, focusing on natural treatments for neurotrauma and amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, or some of you might know it better as Lou Gehrig's disease. So I have experience working in the central nervous system, um, specifically the brain, that translates very well into my research at Opus, um, where we focus on the eye. I'm also very familiar with diseases um, that really have an impact on patients' life, such as Lou Gehrig's disease, um, and now inherited retinal diseases where patients um, really receive a devastating diagnosis and have to shift um, their lifestyle really to um, accommodate this. Um, so as a bench scientist though, I'm always looking for more ways to get involved. And so I was notified that the Corridoremia Research Foundation um, was looking for early career scientists. And so, yeah, just glad to be here and uh, hopefully give you a good overview of behind the scenes of gene therapy and what I do as an scientist. So I'll give a brief overview today of Opus Genetics, and then I'll really get into the nitty gritty of the overview and development of gene therapy. Um, this includes the basics, right? What, are, what is a gene? What is a protein? What, is, what are gene therapies, such as AAV gene therapy? Um, and then how we test them preclinically. And then at the end, I'll take any additional questions um, or throughout, if you have questions, happy to answer those as well. Uh, so Opus Genetics develops therapeutics to treat rare inherited retinal diseases or IRDs. Um, we received our seed funding in September of 2021 uh, from the Foundation Fighting Blindness. And our gene therapy technology is based on uh, research by Dr. Jean Bennett at the University of Pennsylvania and Dr. Eric Pierce at Harvard Medical School, um, Massachusetts Eye and Ear. Uh, in October of 2021, our Chief Scientific o Officer, Ash Jayagopal, was appointed. And then in April of 2022, we collaborated with a manufacturing partner to manufacture our AAV gene therapy. In June of 2022, our 
Chief Executive Officer, Dr. Ben Yerksa was appointed. And then we continued expanding the leadership team and hiring personnel. In December of 2022, we were very excited to receive FDA clearance for an investigational new drug application um, for our gene therapy targeting LCA5. And in this year in April um, and so on and so forth, we're continuing development on another uh, clinical program, BEST1, and um, some of our preclinical programs. And we've con uh, been able to present data on some of those preclinical programs at international conferences, such as ARVO. Um, we also do support patients through providing patient resources and launching a patient outreach webinar and also co-sponsoring the Unirare study. So more than 280 genes when mutated cause inherited retinal disease or IRDs. And IRDs account for up to 20% of all blindness in individuals aged 16 to 64. So the IRD is different depending on the gene that is mutated. And this is because the disease symptoms were initially identified in patients and then the IRDs were named. However, with the advancement and increased accessibility of genetic testing, um, scientists are able to link many genes to the IRDs, which is why some genes, as you can see here, have implications in multiple IRDs. So you can see there's a lot of gene targets um, on the slide that lead to IRDs that could be potential um, gene therapy targets. So Opus's goal is to expand the number of gene therapies available for retinal diseases. Um, choroideremia, more specifically, is a rare X-linked recessive dystrophy that leads to degeneration of the retinal pigment epithelium, the photoreceptors, and the choriocapillaris. And I'll get into uh, some of those um, terms a little bit later when we talk about the anatomy of the eye and the retina. Choroideremia represents 2% of retinal dystrophies. Um, however, unlike some of those other genes I just showed, um, unlike some of those other inherited retinal diseases I just showed, choroideremia um, has been, only one gene has been linked to choroideremia and that's the CHM gene. And interestingly enough, choroideremia um, is often sometimes diagnosed, misdiagnosed as retinitis pigmentosa or liver congenital amaurosis, um, some of those other IRDs I, shown on the, I showed on the previous slide. Um, so although only one gene has been shown to cause choroideremia, there's 280, over 280 um, mutations that have been identified in this gene to be associated with choroideremia. So that makes gene therapy a promising treatment option for choroideremia. So before I get um, any further, I'd like to just take a step back and talk about some anatomy of the eye and the retina, um, which will be valuable when we begin to talk about how gene therapy works. So this is a diagram of the eye. Um, the retina is the innermost light sensitive layer of tissue in the eye, and it's just a thin layer that lines the back of the eye. So light enters through the cornea and then gets focused by the lens on the fovea, which is a small indentation in the retina. And the fovea is really necessary in being preserved. Um, it contains um, a high uh, concentration of cones. And this is where our high acuity daytime visual function comes from. This is what the retina looks like when the doctor looks into a healthy eye. Um, so they can see the back of your eye or your fundus. So this is called a fundus image. And the fundus shows the retina the retinal vasculature, the optic disc, which contains the optic nerve, and the macula, which contains the fovea. And so the doctor can perform a direct inspection of the vasculature and health of the retina through fundus imaging. Um, so the retina isn't uh, just a layer of one cell. It contains many layers and many cells. And light actually must pass through the thickness of the retina to reach the photoreceptors, which are at the back of the retina. So we have photoreceptor cells that are called rods and cones. Rod photoreceptors give us dim light vision where we don't perceive color 
and cones give us um, high resolution daytime color vision. So these photoreceptor cells sense light and then generate an electrical signal in response. The photoreceptors then can pass that electrical signal back up through the retina, um, back through the retina to some of these other cells such as horizontal cells, bipolar cells, and amacrine cells. And these types of cells um, add more information to our vision. So they help process that electrical signal. And um, then the electrical signal is passed to ganglion cells and passed through the optic nerve to the brain. And so the brain then processes that signal and um, gives us visual function, gives us sight. I'd also like to mention two important um, structures that lie under the photoreceptors. Um, so this includes the retinal pigment epithelium and the choroid. And the retinal pigment epithelium sit just under the photoreceptors and they're very important in helping support photoreceptor metabolism and recycling visual pigment. Um, so they really help the photoreceptors perform their visual functions. And then the choroid is the blood supply to the retina. So taking it back to opus, um, I've given a good overview of the basic anatomy and cell types of the retina. So I just wanna finish speaking about opus's role in developing gene therapies. Um, so we take a bedside to bench to bedside approach. We begin with patients and we can identify a gene in patients that, can lead to, that leads to an inherited retinal disease. We can then develop um, a gene therapy in the lab to target that genetic mutation. Um, and we can do this on site in our lab in Durham. And so we can test our gene therapy and cell and animal models to confirm safety and efficacy. We then work with a manufacturing partner to develop a gene therapy under more strict conditions than that which was used in the research and develop lab to make sure that our gene therapy that we provide to patients is of very high quality. We can then apply for an investigational um, new drug application but from, for the, from the FDA. And if it's received, we can then begin clinical trials and hopefully someday provide the gene therapy back to the patients. All right, so um, I'll switch gears a little bit and to tell you about how Opus uses adeno-associated virus to deliver gene therapy. So we use gene augmentation therapy to address inherited retinal diseases. Um, before I get to describing adeno-associated virus, I just wanna go over some of the basics. So talking about what genes are and what they do, what proteins are and what they do, some types of gene and protein defects. And then finally, I'll talk about how we use adeno-associated virus um, to target some of these uh, genetic defects. So genes give instruction for making proteins. A gene is a unit of heredity, and it's a specific sequence of DNA that provides instructions for a cell to make something. Um, and this sequence is a code. It's a code made of, we'll say, uh, A, Gs, Cs, and Ts, and these are called nucleotides. Um, so each person receives one copy of a gene pair from his mother, his or her mother, and one from father. Um, genes are tightly wound up to make chromosomes. And normally each cell in the human body has 23 pairs of chromosomes. Um, so you may have heard of 23 and me, that's where this comes from. And so remember we have pairs, so we have a total of 46 total chromosomes, 23 pairs, 46 total. And so half come from mom and half come from dad. And so all of our genes, which is called our genome, are present in all of our cells. And um, I mentioned we have a pair of each gene. So a specific gene is only activated in cells where it is needed. So this could be one cell type, or it could be um, in every cell type in, the, in your body. I'd also like to touch on um, something called the central dogma of biology. And so this is 
where uh, DNA, so that genetic code is transcribed into RNA, um, which is another type of code um, for simplicity, and that makes protein. So I mentioned each gene provides a code which tells the cell to make something. Um, this code can be tr uh, translated into a specific sequence of what we call amino acids. And as this code is read by machinery in the cell, it makes a chain of amino acids and that chain becomes more structured and eventually we end up with a mature protein. Um, so humans have uh, about 20,000 different proteins some of these common ones you might hear about, um, like collagen or lactase. Um, and again, some proteins are needed in one or a few cell types and others everywhere. So we have certain proteins which are only needed in our eye, some that are maybe only needed in the liver or the lungs, and then some proteins that are required in all of those cells, needed for those cells to function. Um, and proteins, right, they are molecular machines, so they do have important functions. Um, however, when mutations occur in those genes that code for those proteins, that make those proteins, this can cause a disruption in function of the protein. Um, so again, protein is a molecular machine. It has a function. Um, I'd like to talk about a few different mutations that can cause different types of protein defects. And this matters because you can only, um, you can use certain types of gene therapy to target certain mutations. Um, so let's think, uh, we have this protein here that has a normal function. And let's say for relatability, that normal function is doing laundry. Um, so when that gene is um, properly, has the proper, code, it produces a normally functioning protein. This protein is just great at doing laundry. You have clean clothes to wear for the week. Um, however, when that genetic code becomes mutated, it can sometimes cause a loss of function in the protein. And so this could, that gene, genetic code that's mutated could result in a protein that is just not even made or it could result in a protein that is made, but just doesn't do anything. It sits in the cell and accumulates. And so a loss of function mutation um, and protein product in this case causes dirty laundry to just pile up uh, within the cell. Um, so no laundry is getting done. We also have another loss of function mutation, which can cause the protein to be made that has a little bit of function. Um, so in this case, the clothes are, you know, sitting in the washer, but they're sudsy. They're not really getting clean. Um, you're still not getting getting the laundry done. We also have other types of genetic mutations which do cause the protein to be made, but cause the protein to be overfunctional or causes too much protein to be made. Um, resulting in too much of the function, a gain of function. And so in this case, your laundry uh, machine is, is breaking, it's overflowing, your clothes are ruined. So even though it's um, pre performing its function, it's doing it at a, it's doing it way too well um, at a really high capacity. And so you end up with um, damage. Um, so OPA specializes in treating inherited retinal disease cause of loss of function mutations. Um, so we can use gene augmentation therapy to treat these loss of function mutations in which the protein isn't made or the protein's made and non-functional or has very limited function. For gain of function mutations, there are other types of um, gene therapies that can be used to target these. So this includes gene editing and silence in place techniques. Um, so I mentioned there are 280 mutations identified um, in the CHM gene to cause choroideremia. And so most of these mutations result in non-functional proteins. So these are loss of function mutations. So gene uh, choroideremia uh, is a good candidate for gene augmentation therapy. 
And so Opus specifically uses, and big part of the topic uh, of the talk today is adeno-associated virus or AAV. So we use AAV to deliver the therapeutic gene to the cells. Um, and there are some other gene augmentation therapies, um, but I'll focus on AAV today. So simply put, AAV is a protein shell or a capsid surrounding and protecting a small single-stranded uh, DNA genome. And so there's limits on to how much DNA you can actually put into this. And so we can administer AAV through a subretinal injection to reach cells at the back of the retina. And um, this injection uh, requires um, a cannula to be inserted and the AAV is injected under the photoreceptor layer, but above the retinal pigment epithelium. And so this creates a bleb of the injected liquid, which localizes, and some local localized retinal detachment, which dissipates over time. And from there on, we can take advantage of what viruses do naturally. So this is infecting cells and donate, donating their DNA. So in this diagram, we have an AAV particle, which contains the code for the therapeutic gene. And so I mentioned the AAV particle has a capsid protecting the therapeutic gene. And this capsid can be recognized by certain cell types. So once inside the cell, the capsid is broken down and the DNA for the therapeutic gene reaches the nucleus. And the nucleus um, is the part of the cell which does contain DNA. So the cell can undergo then the central dogma of biology and can take the AAV particle um, gene instructions and use their own, the cell will use its own machinery to make RNA, amino, um, amino acids, and then protein. And uh, the protein will be the functional protein because we provided the cell with the correct genetic code for the functional protein. There are some considerations for AAV. Um, this includes cargo size. So we can only fit so much DNA into that uh, particle, into that AAV particle. Um, so this can be limiting in terms of uh, which genes we're targeting. The capsid structure is determined by a serotype. And so some serotypes have more efficient genes transfer um, in different organs than others, different cell types. And we also have the promoter. So this causes the gene to be expressed in certain cell types. And so something to consider when creating an AAV construct. Um, and so we want a promoter that will drive expression in retinal pigment epithelium cells, for example, for some IRDs. And then finally, the amount of uh, amount needed, the amount, amount of titer, the, the titer is something to consider. So how much, uh, do we need to inject for it to have a therapeutic benefit? So to summarize, genes are instructions for making protein. And the central dogma of biology is DNA to RNA to protein. Proteins are molecular, molecular machines that perform important functions in cells. And so sometimes we have mutations in genes which can alter the function of that protein that's made. So we have loss of function mutations, which can cause no protein to be made or a um, non-functional protein or barely functioning protein to be made and gain of function mutations, which can cause too much protein to be made in an overactive function. And so loss of function mutations can be treated by delivering a normal copy of the mutant gene to the correct type of cell using AAV gene therapy. So now I'd like to switch gears. And now that you have an idea of what an AAV uh, gene therapy is, um, what it does in the cell, I can talk to you a little bit more about what I do in my day to day, which is how we test a gene therapy in appropriate models of inherited retinal diseases. And so this is the step before the gene therapy moves into the clinic. So this slide is just showing um, 
very basic AAV gene therapy discovery process. And what I'll focus a lot on during this talk is research and development and preclinical studies. So in the lab, we can, or, well, I guess in the lab as well, but we can identify a target. So we can identify a genetic mutation which causes an IRD in patients. And then we can develop an AAV construct. And so then we can take that AAV construct and research it. And we can do this using in vitro and in vivo studies, which are studies in cells and animals. And we can also do perform some toxicity testing to make sure the AAV gene therapy is safe. So we can study the retina using cell and animal models. I mentioned in vitro and in vivo. So in vitro refers to experiments using cell models that are grown in a dish and survive in a dish, while in vivo refers to experiments using animal models. And typically as a first step, research typically begins in vitro in those cell models. Um, growing and maintaining cells can be much more uh, quicker, it can be quicker and more cost-effective than breeding, housing, and caring for animals. And it's just a good proof of concept that our AAV gene therapy does what it's supposed to um, in a cell model. And also cells can be more easily genetically modified to have a genetic mutation that causes an inherited retinal disease um, versus an animal. So we can test our AAV gene therapy in cell models of the retina that have genetic mutations that are grown in a dish. As I mentioned earlier, there are many cell types within the retina that we can model. So a particular cell type may harbor a mutation in a protein that is crucial to that cell's function. And so this can lead to or contribute to an IRD. So the CHM gene provides instructions for the REP1 protein. And the REP1 protein has important functions in the photoreceptors and the retinal pigment epithelium. So when mutations happen in the CHM gene, um, the REP1 protein uh, can become non-functional and this causes the health of these cells, the photoreceptors and retinal pigment epithelium um, to degenerate. And so we can model, let's say the retinal pigment epithelium. And how can we do that? Well, hopefully this isn't too graphic, um, but we can actually isolate an eye from an animal which carries a mutation known to affect the retinal pigment epithelium. And we can make a cut to separate the front from the back of the eye. And remember that the retina is a thin layer that lines the back of the eye. So once we've made that cut and isolated the back of the eye, we can actually place the back of the eye in a dish and add certain substances to it, which can cause the cells of the retina to detach and float in a solution. In the lab, we can then pick out, um, let's say the retinal pigment epithelium cells from this solution and plate them in a dish. And this dish has supplements and nutrients that allows these cells to continue um, being alive in this dish. And so then we can maintain them in the dish and treat them with our AAV gene therapy and run experiments. So that was called the dissociation culture method of isolating retinal pigment epithelium cells or other cell types of the retina. Um, there's a few others that I'll just really briefly touch on. Um, so one is an explant. So isolating a retina um, and laying it flat in a dish and the retinal explant is unique in that it does maintain the structure of the retina. So it maintains the cell types and the ordering and structure of the retina in this dish. There's also a retinosphere, which is a little unique in that you take, um, isolate a retina from say an animal and you can cut it up into little pieces, place it in the dish. And these pieces will spontaneously form um, spheres, retinospheres, spheres of the retina, where photoreceptors are on the outside and other cell types on the inside. Um, however, most of you, and which is which most which is most widely used, um, might be most familiar with stem cells. So stem cells can be derived from a patient that has a mutation 
which causes an inherited retinal disease. So these cells, um, after being isolated, can be plated in a dish and then can be instructed to become, let's say, a retinal organoid or a specific retinal cell. Um, and retinal organoid is very similar to that retinosphere I just talked about. So just a sphere of cells with photoreceptors on the outside and the other retinal cells inside. And the retinal cell lines could be photoreceptor, um, ganglion cells, retinal pigment epithelial cells that can be maintained um, in a dish. So I mentioned we can derive stem cells from a patient's own cell that have known mutations which cause an inherited retinal disease. So when we do isolate those cells and tell them to become or give them supplements uh, to make them become a certain retinal cell or a retinal organoid, those derived cells will also contain the mutation that the patient had. And if we do take stem cells uh, from an individual that doesn't have an IRD, we can also introduce um, disease-causing mutations into these cells um, using CRISPR-Cas9 technology. So we, we can use these cell models to model inherited retinal diseases and have the mutations um, that patients have. So let's say we've taken um, stem cells, uh, or we've taken stem cells from a patient that has an inherited retinal disease, and we've instructed that cell to become, let's say, a photoreceptor cell. And so that photoreceptor cell also has the mutation. And so the cell isn't healthy. Um, it's not functioning properly. So we can treat that cell in the dish with our AAV gene therapy. The AAV will undergo that central dogma of biology and the protein, the proper protein, functioning protein will be made. And then we can actually, in the lab, run experiments to measure that protein to see the levels. And we can also look at um, levels of the uh, DNA, so the ther levels of that therapeutic gene to ensure it's being, um, to ensure the cell is taking it up properly and that the protein is being made. And then we can also measure uh, function in the lab. So we can look at the photoreceptor cell that's been treated with our AAV to see if um, its protein is functioning properly after being treated. So now I'll talk a little bit about how we can study the retina using animal models. And this refers to as, these are in vivo experiments. So experiments using animals. Um, humans and animals are complex organisms. So we have organs that perform specific physiological functions. Um, there's crosstalk between the organs that involve hormones, circulating factor. There's cells within tissues. So we're complex, uh, much more complex than just a cell type in a dish um, or a retinal organoid. Um, so these in vivo models, which include anywhere from zebrafish to non-human primates or monkeys, um, are used for experiments. And um, some of these mammals uh, have more similarities to humans than others. And so this allows us, these experiments allow uh, for the ability to assess gene therapy um, due to perform extensive testing that can't be done in humans. Um, so this could be testing at molecular, cellular, and functional levels. And I'll actually go into a little bit of this in the next couple of slides, um, specifically for mouse models. Um, so the animal models allow us to understand safety, toxicity, and efficacy of gene therapy. However, there are trade-offs when choosing a model. So this includes, um, you know, how similar is the model to humans? How easy is the model to raise? And how quickly does the, it does the animal uh, grow up so we can study it? Um, how easy the animal is to genetically modify to have those mutations that we see in patients. And so the model we choose, whether that be zebrafish or a non-human primate model, can also is also determined by what we need to study. So for example, 
uh, zebrafish have external em embryos, which allow us to very easily study retinal development. Um, so that might be a reason you pick a zebrafish model. Mice have a short lifespan and can be easily genetically modified to have mutations which cause IRDs. Um, on the other hand, monkeys have a very similar eye to humans, uh, but are much more expensive and require more time to raise and are not very easily genetically modified to have mutations. Um, I'd also like to mention that some of these models naturally have retinal degeneration, and so they are used as experimental models. So some cats and dog, some cat and dog breeds have progressive retinal atrophies that are natural, um, and they they have similar or the same mutations that have been observed in patients with IRDs. Um, so actually at Opus Genetics, we are able to study mice in-house. And um, mice are also very uh, commonly used in research. So I'm just going to go over a few of the, of the examples of the extensive testing that you can do in mouse models. Um, so this includes looking at retinal structure um, by doing something called histology. You can also do fundus imaging and optical coherence tomography in mice. Uh, we can look at retinal function using an electroretinogram and the optokinetic reflex. So I'll go through some of these examples um, and hopefully you'll realize just how important these assays are in testing the safety and efficacy of gene therapy before we move into um, humans. So this is an example of, of histology, um, histological staining. And so, as I mentioned, um, and you've seen this diagram many times throughout, the retina has many layers um, consisting of many different cells. And so the right image is um, a histology image. And so this is, we've isolated the retina and we can treat the retina so that we can visual, visualize different cell types under the retina. So you can actually see the different layers of the retina um, when looking under a fluorescent microscope. And so this helps us look at, you know, is there cell loss in a certain layer of the retina? So this, the cell survival of the uh, retina. We can also use a very high resolution um, electron microscope to look at structures within individual cells of individual cells in the retina. And so in this image, uh, you can see an electron mic microscopy image, and you can actually see that the um, this is a rod photoreceptor. It does look very similar to that um, shown in the illustration. So you can see there is quite a bit of detail there. And so these uh, types of imaging lets us see the health and structure of the cells. We can also perform fundus imaging, just like um, you may have gotten done at the eye doctor. So looking at the back um, or the or the ret the back of the eye, uh, the fundus, and looking at the retinal vasculature and the um, health of the retina, and so we can use these imaging techniques in mice treated with our AAV gene therapy to see if the therapy is able to preserve the retina. We can also look further at retinal structure using optical coherence tomography. So on the bottom is showing. Uh, human OCT. So this is looking at the cell layers of the retina. And on the top, we see a mouse receiving an OCT. And you can still see a similar image there where we get an image produced showing the different layers of the retina. And this is similar in that if there's a decrease in thickness of a layer in the retina, that could indicate some cell loss. So we could um, treat our mouse with AAV gene therapy and see if the retina is being preserved compared to a mouse that hasn't been treated, that has a mutation that causes an IRD. We can look at retinal function using an electroretinogram or an ERG. So an ERG is like an EKG uh, for your heart, but it's for your eye. And so far left imaging is a human getting an ERG. Middle is an example mouse receiving ERG. And on the right, uh, we see a ERG uh, waveform. So this is the data output. And 
uh, this waveform is measuring the electrical signals from the different cell types of the retina. And so depending on how this waveform looks, you can um, see if certain cell types are maybe not functioning. And so this is measuring function of retinal cells. And so we can treat a mouse with our AV gene therapy and use an ERG to see if retinal function is being preserved. And finally, um, another measure of visual function would be the optokinetic reflex. And so in humans, we have uh, something similar, the Snellen eye chart. Um, and on, on the right, we have a, um, something called the optodrum. And so this is just a measure of the optokinetic reflex, an instrument to measure this. And we have, uh, it's essentially a box with monitors along the sides and different lines of different thicknesses and contrast appear on these monitors and move in front of the mouse's uh, visual field. And there's a camera that sits above the mouse that tracks the movement of the mouse or the optokinetic reflex of the mouse and will tell us if the mouse is able to see and is tracking that line or if they're not able to see and uh, are, are looking elsewhere or not. Um, not able to see that line. So this would be a measure of visual acuity. And so when we've treated mice with our AAV gene therapy, we can see if there's an improvement in visual acuity versus mice that haven't been treated. Um, so I went over a lot about preclinical studies um, in vitro and in vivo studies, but I just wanna mention a really important stage in the preclinical studies uh, discovery process that's called toxicity testing. So toxicology studies tell us about the safety of our AAV gene therapy. And they're typically done in, in two models, two animal models. And um, there's a range of doses. So there's a high, there's a therapeutic dose, and then there's a higher dose than the therapeutic dose and a lower dose than that therapeutic dose. And we also look at um, biodistribution in these types of studies. So I mentioned that we can target our AAV into certain cell types, for example, the retinal pigment epithelium cells. Um, if we target our AAV there in the retina, we don't wanna see it ending up in other organs. Um, so this, these types of studies test for that. These studies are also uh, about three months out following the treatment of AAV. So they're a little longer term duration, looking at the safety, um, inflammation. And um, these studies are also strictly regulated by the federal drug agency um, or some type of regulatory agency. Um, so once we've uh, finished our preclinical testing, we can hopefully move into clinical trials. And so we will take all of our data preclinical data, um, toxicology data, and can submit something. We can put it together in reports and submit something um, to the FDA called an investigation of new drug application. And if that's approved, then, um, I mean, this, this application, it's, it's a large document and proves to the FDA that we've looked at the safety and efficacy of our AAV gene therapy. And so then if we receive approval, we can move into clinical trials. Um, which do continue looking at dosage, safety, and efficacy monitoring in humans. Um, and so even after there's approval, we do still get this continual evaluation. Um, and so hopefully that was a good overview of um, the AAV, of what AAV is and its preclinical uh, development. And so thank you. That was really good. Thank you. I like the washer analogy. We haven't had that one yet. <laughs> yeah, just trying to think of something that's relatable to what people do every day, right? Because our cells have functions that they need to complete every day, so. It's true. You know, folks, now is the time to uh, write in those questions. We have two right now. So if you have more, you can either use the Q&A or the chat feature. 
Um, so Lisa, hey Lisa, um, is asking a question. Can AAV be used specifically in cases of deletions in the CHM gene? And thank you for your, for your presentation. Yep, that's an example, right? That could be um, an example of a genetic mutation that causes a loss of function in that CHM protein. So we would deliver using AAV the instructions for that deleted gene to the cell um, so that that cell can start making the protein um, of the gene that was deleted. So, yep, that's, that's a great example. All right. Let me switch over here to the Q&A. Bob asks a question. I've already undergone subretinal gene therapy. When the time comes for you folks to conduct human trials, is my history a disqualifier for participating? That is an excellent question. Yeah. Um, so I'm more on the preclinical side, but from what I do understand, I, I, I do believe it might be a disqualifier. Yes. At least initially, maybe. Yes. Yeah, so I, I, yeah. I think so. Okay. But yeah, um, but definitely, I think when the time comes, um, definitely reach out and then we can, we can take it from there. This is from an anonymous attendee. Uh, what would it take for Opus to consider adding CHM to their pipeline in the future? Yep. You knew um, that's going to come. We talked about yeah, that. Definitely. Um, so yeah, right now we are focusing on our clinical stage programs, such as BEST1 and LCA5, but definitely down the line, uh, we are open to considering taking on a CHM program. And that's really the goal of Opus is to uh, create more gene therapies for these inherited retinal diseases, in, including choroideremia. And I can speak on behalf of the foundation, if I may, is just that we are very, the board of directors is very specifically looking for new partners. And that's why, you know, as Kathy and Neil found you, that's how we always want to be working with new investigators and new companies and new concepts. And although AAV gene therapy isn't new, perhaps you do things differently. So definitely open to it. Thanks. All right. Here's another question from Bob. How does your current model compare to what has already been done with respect to gene therapy? Um, let's see, current model as in, um, well, we spend a lot of time develop, I think maybe this is kind of targeting this. We spend a lot of time developing our AAV constructs, um, in the lab and, um, uh, really optimizing that, uh, that part that has contains the DNA. Um, so it's called codon optimizing. So we can do that in the lab. Um, let's see, we also do test preclinically in-house, um, so we can control, as a, as a company, we can really control that preclinical development. Um, those are just some, some examples of, mm -hmm. of what we do specifically at Opus. I think that answers the question. It is, it is, it is, it is one that I think a lot of people would be thinking, how does it differ from the other ones that we currently have been working with? So that's good. So yeah, we still do use AAB. Um, and so, yeah, uh, I, yeah, I guess if there's a follow up question to that, I'd be happy to answer more. Jan is asking when, oh, hold on a second. When you have delivered a DNA molecule to a cell nucleus, I guess it will be degraded after a while. How long will the DNA survive? Um, so, if the cell gets infected with the AAV, uh, it will, it should remain in that specific cell type. Um, and we typically see expression, uh, you know, there hasn't been any record of decreasing expression in some of the uh, research that I've done. Um, but I guess length of time that it survives does kind of depend on the construct that you choose. Um, and I, uh, yeah, I think it, it does really depend on the the gene therapy and the, the DNA that you're, or sorry, the gene that you're targeting um, and cell type as well. Um, some gene therapies uh, that might target other organs such that have cells that turn over highly, such as uh, like the liver, those might um, be degraded quicker and not show expression long-term. Um, so it does depend. Okay. Eric Hartman asks, 
In your preclinical studies, you mentioned toxicity. The eye is usually referred to as immune privilege, but we have heard of inflammation responses to AAV vectors. So is it really immune privileged? Wow, these are hard questions. Yeah, um, no, that's a really good question. Um, so the eye is immune privileged specifically in the subretinal space. So that space between the photoreceptors and the retinal pigment epithelium. That, However, that doesn't mean um, immune privilege. It doesn't mean there's no immune response. Um, so I showed the subretinal injection, which does cause cause that bleb, right, um, where you have a little bit of retinal detachment locally. And so that does inherently cause uh, some immune response. And the hope is that it, uh, that it dissipates um, over time. So, uh, but immune privileged, the eye is immune privileged compared to some, um, some other organs as well. But there is still that inflammatory response, which has been seen in clinical trials. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Here's the next question. Thanks for the great webinar. It seems the gene therapy for choroideremia is under the premise that the REP1 protein can restore function performance of degenerated cells. Can you please confirm this? And if that's true, can protein delivery to the degenerated cells achieve similar results? Okay. Um, so yes, specifically for choroideremia, we would develop, and, and there has been an AAV2 REP1 um, gene therapy that is actually currently in trials, but um, that does uh, basically give the cell instructions to make that REP1 protein, um, a functional REP1 protein, and um, then the cell, the, for example, the retinal pigment epithelium could keep supporting the photoreceptors and performing that function. Um, and so I think the question was asked if you could give protein instead of the genetic. Can, can, it says the last sentence, if that's true, can protein delivery to the degenerated cells achieve similar results? Um, so the problem is protein can be uh, degraded very easily. So, and um, I, I can't imagine, you, I don't believe you can't uh, just give like the cell protein and uh, that would also create a functional response and um, could cause some uh, issues within the cell as like protein buildup. Um, so the cell, really the way is to have the cell make the protein itself um, that has a functional protein. Okay. Is BEST1 treatable using gene augmentation therapy? Um, we believe so, <laughs> uh, but you know, right now we're in uh, early stages. Um, so uh, stay tuned, I suppose. <laughs> but, okay. yeah. That's fair. All right, we have another question from Bob. What endpoints do you think would you, ah, this is a good one. What endpoints do you think you would use to prove efficacy? Um, and actually addressing the previous question, there are, which maybe I didn't touch on, there are uh, multiple forms of best one. And so there's a recessive form that can, that gene therapy can be uh, used to target. So um, that's one that we are currently developing. and. Um, for the, can you repeat that second question? Sorry. Oh, you bet. You bet. It's about endpoints. Um, it says, sure. what endpoints do you think Opus Genetics would use to provide or prove efficacy? Um, so again, I'm more preclinical uh, side of things, and I'm assuming this wow. is probably in clinical trials. Um, mm -hmm. One is the, uh, I know visual acuity doesn't always seem to match up uh, with the degeneration. Um, there are some other assays like, um, like a, a maze type uh, obstacle course, which could be used, um, but I can't speak too much to the clinical side of, of endpoints at, at this time right now, um, especially since we aren't specifically developing a gene therapy for choroideremia right now. And, and maybe as you get closer to the gate, we would be able to help or give just insider thoughts on that as we can as, a, as an organization and our experience. 
Um, all right, Eric Hartman. Oh, there's more questions coming in. So this is exciting. Thank you. Um, yeah, so, oh, Eric. So does CHM explain my poor laundry skills, my poor skills with my laundry? Uh -huh. <laughs> well, I mean, uh -huh. well, we can say so. Sure. <laughs> sure. Wow. Uh, okay. Uh, considering your workflow, excuse me a second. Let's just see a couple more came in. Considering your workflow from the preclinical to the clinical phase is specific to each mutation. How does, how long does each development cycle take and how can you scale the process? Hmm. Uh, that is a tough question in that, you know, like you mentioned, the gene therapy is specific to the gene mutation. I feel like um, every preclinical to clinical trial does have its variation in, in duration and how long preclinical research takes versus clinical and how many maybe obstacles you hit um, along the way or kind of pivots pivots that you need to take. Um, so it, it's it's hard. I, I believe the... Um, uh, RP65 Luxterno Therapeutic took, uh, I want to say like 15 years. Don't quote me <laughs> on that, but um, these things do take time, unfortunately. Yeah, we're familiar with that. Uh, and I feel like it's not for lack of lack of trying. I mean, I, I think we do really want to make sure that we understand um, what we're giving to patients. So um, it's like, I know it does take, it, it seems like you know, not much is going on, but I can tell you in the, in my day to day, a lot is going on and, um, it's really in, in the patient's, uh, interest. The last comment that we got was just great. Many thanks and a great webinar. It was, it was a great fundamental, um, learning one that we certainly can share with our friends, our family to better understand what gene therapy is. So it was really good. Great. Thanks. Yeah, I had fun. I like, um, I feel like a lot of people forget about the preclinical side of things. And so um, I'd like to share kind of what I do. And uh, thanks for having me as well. Well, it's super important that we continue to have these kinds of discussions to get better relationships that we have with with our manufacturers and with our clinicians and the researchers, it's just paramount that we just continue to push the ball forward, whether it be gene therapy or other studies that we've had historically doing these webinars in the last few years. So we're super excited and we're really grateful that you're on our bench. So thank you. Thank you as well. Yeah. So once again, everybody, thank you. We are going to be having a few more of these webinars in the next few weeks. So. Keep your eyes peeled, watch your email for further information um, and invitations, sign up, watch the recordings, and we'll see you again. Thank you to 4DMT and have a great day. Thanks so much. Bye-bye. Thank you. you. Thank you again. Of course.